Oh my gosh, I cannot believe it's that time already. It's not really time for me, but according to the comments, it's time for some of you all. I <laughs> tried to not say y'all. Don't know why, decided that I didn't want to say y'all. It... Hey, what's up, Garden Friends? Jeff here. How's everybody doing? Hope you're doing well. I'm great. I've been getting a few comments from people that some of you guys are starting to move your house plants inside. I forget that a lot of you do live further north than I do. My plants don't come inside until around mid-October to mid-November, just depends on the year. But that had me thinking that this would be a good time to talk about some of your annuals that you can move inside and keep as house plants. Not everything has to go to waste. Oh, and I just thought of another one. So it's going to be a list of 10. It's going to be 11. <laughs> 11 plants that you can go ahead and move inside, keep them as a house plant during the winter time. Most of these are plants that are fairly easy to grow and shouldn't cause too much fuss, but some of them do have some more special care requirements just because you know, they're annuals. They're meant to be outside. Debated holding off on this video for a few more weeks, but I have a bad habit every single year of waiting until I'm moving stuff inside to start talking about these things. And I do that having forgotten that a lot of the people who watch these videos are already moving their stuff inside. Impatience. They don't make the best house plants, but if you have a south, southwest facing window and your home is fairly warm, you can move them in. Whenever I've taken impatience inside, they've always done their best if I make sure to give them a good cut back, like 50% something along those lines, and then I water them very sparingly because my house isn't very warm. So between 68 and 72 degrees, that's what I'm going to refer to as average household temperatures, which I think is 20 to like 22 point something Celsius being average household temperatures. My humidity is very low during the winter time, and that's why they don't do great. In my grow space, hot, warm, cool, the, the temperatures in there vary, and patients always do great. The main thing I have to remember is just don't overwater them. It can be tempting with everything I'm going to talk about to water them very heavily because that's what we do during the growing season, right? You have all these beautiful plants outside and they need a lot of water because it's warm. You don't have to worry about that once they're inside. It's not warm. They don't have as much airflow. You can chill on the watering. And sometimes with the impatience, watering from below can make a big difference. And this is more for impatience that are potted. If they're in the landscape, it can be more difficult making the transition indoors. If they're in the ground, you're going to have more soil around the roots, right? As opposed to maybe a potting mix that drains better and will be better for the plants inside. If you're going to bring in patients that are in the ground inside, then you're definitely going to want to cut them back by 50%. Dig them up, get as much of the ground soil out as you can without turning up the roots too much. That's where it gets tricky because they have fine roots. Repot them wash them off heavily so not bringing pests into the house. And they'll usually do okay, but it's gonna take them some time to rebound. They can be messy. A few of the plants I'm gonna talk about can be messy because they're flowering plants. So they're gonna be dropping petals all over the place when they start to do their thing. But I guess that's just the price you pay for getting to have some nice color in the house during the winter time. Something a little bit easier that is a great annual and also an excellent house plant, begonias. So right here is just a pink dragon's wing begonia. The bulk of begonias make fine house plants. It's gonna be the same with the impatiens as far as making sure there's a lot of light forms so south, southwest facing window. They're not gonna want their soil to be moist at all times. The begonia, you wanna let them dry out a good amount in between waterings. Again, that's with average household temperatures. Sometimes watering from below, just like the impatiens, can be beneficial if you're concerned about drainage and stuff like that. Root rot tends to be the cause of death for I think just about everything I'm going to talk about here. So just take it easy on the water. Move them in, let the plant tell you what it wants. I don't always give the begonias a cutback when I move them inside. They don't seem to need it, but there are types that will. So if you're going more of a tuberous begonia, you might want to give them a cutback. That's just going to encourage them to flush back out from below. And basically you're just resetting them by giving them a prune before you move them back into the house. And I'll usually have my begonias flower for me throughout the majority of the winter time. The intensity of the flower color can shift quite a bit. They can become more pale and not quite as exciting to look at, but still, it's fun. They have those beautiful peduncles, <laughs> right? The parts that they hang from. Just nice to have something that's flowering in the house during the winter time when we miss being outside. Gives us something to look at. It's kind of rejuvenating and refreshing. But I saw a hummingbird very easily distracted. It's one of those days out here where there's so many things to do that I'm just kind of have my head spinning. Another great one. Vinca makes a fine house plant as long as you have the right light for them. 68 to 72 degrees, somewhere in there, south, southwest facing window. They don't need much water, which is one of the reasons I really do enjoy bringing them in. 
they're not going to be as prone to throwing a fit due to the humidity like you may have with the begonia the dragon wings i've never had issues with them when it comes to humidity and patience they can be more diva-ish if they're in line they're getting hit with drying air from your heaters something like that the vinca don't seem to mind anywhere near as much they don't flower as heavily as the impatiens do so they're not quite as messy they're a very drought tolerant plant so as long as they're getting the right light they do wonderful in the house they don't want to be consistently moist that's a theme with everything i think i mentioned that with the impatiens so it's a good one like with the others to water from below if you're concerned about root rot anything like that just then when I, I guess I didn't explain that, did I? Watering from below, setting them in a dish with water in there and letting them wick that up, then pulling that dish out. Don't let them sit in water for a prolonged period of time, but if you just put some water under there, let them suck it up, that can be good for them as far as helping to prevent root rot and just rot down in the middle. So if you don't have much airflow and you're pouring water down into the center of the plant, what ends up happening is you can start to have some die off and some icky looking foliage on the inside. So if you water from below, don't really have to worry about that. But if you do have more dry conditions and there's a gentle airflow, not directly on the plant, but around the plant, the vinca really aren't too picky. When I take vinca inside, especially into my grow space, they just do their thing pretty much all winter long, so long as they don't get overwatered. These are going to be, I think out of everything I'm going to talk about, probably the ones that would be the most prone to root rot. So. Take it easy. If they start to wilt down, it means they need water. So just pay attention to that schedule and you'll be able to figure out how often they need it. It varies from home to home and climate to climate. So it's hard to say how often to water something. That's why I generally say like 50%. Let it dry out, use a moisture meter, put a wooden stick down there, maybe a chopstick and see if where the color changes, then you know where it's moist. Uh, or just, you know, use your finger, get down in there, see if it's dry. Typically I let them dry out almost all the way during the winter time before I water them again though but uh, I'd say 50% is probably better that's just you know me being a little bit extra safe and I have them in a grow space usually where it's pretty humid so letting them dry out a little bit longer doesn't usually have much of an effect on them in the house yeah I'd say probably every 10 days 7 to 10 days small drink that's all they need I probably should have clarified that when I say south to southwest facing window that what I'm saying is they need a lot of light, a lot of bright, direct light. That's what I should have been saying. The begonia will be fine with filtered light. They don't need it directly on them, but they need a long day of bright light. Epomia, sweet potato vines. So this one, an asterisk for this one, they make okay house plants. Really the nice thing about these is you can dig them up and cut them back remove the dirt from the tuber and store the tuber for like three months, usually in a cool, dark, dry environment, and then replant them around, I'd say February, February to March, late February into March and get them going again. And then you're just kind of ahead of the game for when it's time to plant them outside and you move them outside after the risk of frost is gone. As far as growing it as an actual vine and letting it trail and do its thing in the house you can they just tend to be really messy everything on the inside if you don't have airflow starts to die off you get a lot of yellowing and a lot of crispiness but maybe if you stay on top of pruning then that might be something you're into and you would enjoy giving a try uh, they're just they're so vigorous <laughs> that to me i just think it's a lot easier to just dig them up cut them back and store them but i guess that's not really growing it as a house plant is it so that's why hence the asterisk it's an option don't have to let them die off. You can save them and reuse them for next year, but they are a hybrid, right? So the majority of them, I'll go back over there since I'm talking about them. These aren't like the sweet potato vines that we're eating. They're ornamental. So they don't necessarily have the same storage vigor, <laughs> if that's how you would describe it in the tuber. That's why I say about three months is the longest I think I've ever stored one of their tubers before anything started to go awry with them, which by awry I just mean they start to get some squish and some rot in them. I have also had really good luck storing these by just lifting them up and dropping them into a container, cutting all the foliage off and sticking that under a sink, like just a, a cabinet, a cool, dark, dry place, and then start watering again when the daylight starts to get a little bit longer. So around March, somewhere in there, and they come back on their own. So sometimes you don't even have to cut them back. You can just dig them up and throw their tuber with some soil in it someplace cool dark and dry and they'll come back usually just fine oh and if you are bringing your sweet potato vines inside and you want to actually try and grow them as a house plant they're going to need a lot of light direct light they're going to prefer things more on the warm side 
Good amount of humidity and airflow. I'd still follow the rule though of not watering them too heavily. Wait and see when they tell you they need to be watered and pay attention to that and to establish your own watering cycle. It's probably gonna be every seven to 10 days, something along those lines. These are pretty, very pretty. I love this one, Cressandra. Cressandra makes a fine house plant and they don't need as much light as a lot of the other plants that I've been talking about. Nice long day of bright indirect light will do them just fine. They're gonna want more humidity than some of the other plants. They are much more tropical than say the begonias who can be much more forgiving in the vinca. I wouldn't expect them to flower as heavily inside, but they will still flower throughout the entire year. They don't take much of a break. When I do move crossander inside, I usually cut them back by about 50%, just like I've been saying with some of the other plants. And I water them probably about once a week, somewhere along those lines. These do end up being very prone to spider mite and aphid. So that's something to watch out for. That's really the case for any of these plants that have flowers on them. The impatience of magonias, that's something you have to watch out for. And these you really just treat like you would any other tropical house plant. There's not much else to it. Surprisingly to me, they always do better when I let them dry out a very good amount before watering them. So that seven to 10 days thing, take it with a grain of salt. It's gonna depend on where you live and your environment, your climate. But because things aren't very warm, they don't have the airflow, humidity tends to be much less or much less consistent even. That's why it's best to just go with a little bit less water than too much, right? It's a lot easier to rehydrate a plant than it is to bring it back from issues with rot. And I see them sold fairly often as house plants. Where you live, some of these plants that I'm talking about may not even be things that are sold as annuals in your area. This might be something you only ever see as a house plant. For me, they're usually sold as annuals around here. Which brings me to the next plant. Similar vibe as far as the care goes. Pakistaki's Ludia. Not sold everywhere as an annual. A lot of places these are sold as house plants. I usually see them at the nurseries as both around here. They can usually get them relatively inexpensive in my area. But for some of y'all, this may not even be something you consider an annual. These do very well indoors. They're easy to take care of. Keeping them flowering, not always the situation. You're gonna need a good amount of light to keep them flowering. They benefit from having a good cutback and then being moved inside and stuck someplace that's more on the cool side and allow them to just stay more dry during the winter time where they get watered, I don't know, maybe every couple of weeks and they'll just sort of hang out and chill. Now, if you want to keep them going in active growth and keep them moving and flowering and everything, then more light, more warmth, more humidity. It's a tropical plant, right? But they do well as a plant that can just sit back and chill, which is one of the things I really like about them. Heck, there are years with my pack of stackies. I cut them back, I let them drop all their leaves, I stick them in a dark corner in the garage, and I don't touch them again until spring. They just get a little bit of runoff water, water that shoots off from other plants when I'm in there taking care of things, and that's all they need. Lantana was gonna be the next one, but I don't have any Lantana that's in bloom. So, you, do you know what it is? Here's a picture. With Lantana indoors, I keep that exactly the same way as I do the pack of stackies. I just let it chill. I'll cut it back, stick it someplace a little bit darker and cool, and just give it a very light watering every couple of weeks. But if you want to keep them growing actively, different situation, like I was talking about with the pack of stackies, they're going to need warmth, long day of direct light, and regular watering. I think it's a lot easier to just let them chill and hang out. And when I say dark, let me clarify that. Dark can mean different things. So there's lower light, dark, where you're just letting the plant hang out, it's gonna keep its leaves, and then there's like dark dark, where you're gonna let it defoliate and basically pretend the plant's dormant for a few months. The Pakistakis and the Lantana both do find dormant for a few months, but not much longer than that. So I'd say three months is probably as long as you'd wanna stretch out a dormancy with them, at least from my experience. Usually when I go longer than that, they don't return with a lot of vigor and you gotta give them some TLC to get them back up and moving. So pretty. Tradescantia, really common annual. This is the feel and flirty, so this isn't one that I would plant outside as an annual, but the Nenuk, the Pellita, there are lots of different types. They make great house plants and they're usually pretty common in a lot of places. It's annuals, at least the regular Purple Heart, just Pellita, which surprisingly is it's like the only year that I don't think I have any of that out here. But you get the picture. Same vibe here. This is smaller, different color leaf, but it's the same care very easy to keep inside. You just treat them as a succulent. 
really also one that's going to benefit a lot from watering from underneath if your plants are more prone to rot that meaning your house is just more humid or maybe more on the cool side or both of those things but if you have drier conditions in your home in a window or an area that gets at least i'd say six to eight hours of light a day that can shine through it then these should do pretty well for you water every seven to ten days let the top couple of inches of soil dry out again that's something that you always have to take with a grain of salt that's going to vary on your climate and everything else like i've been talking about with the other plants but for the most part they aren't ones to throw a huge fit if you let them dry out and like i was talking about with the cressandra generally going more on the dry side is better than the wet side because it's a lot easier to rehydrate than combat root rot the main issue i always have with tradescantia in the house isn't related to water actually it's more about light finding the sweet spot for lights that they don't get really leggy happens every year they usually get a little bit leggy on me if i don't put them in a window that's on the south side of the house or underneath a grow light and when that happens it's not that big a deal because you just cut all the stuff off that's looking really stringy and you can take that stuff you cut off and prop it real easily so it's not really a losing situation when you can just make more plants out of them they can be pretty long lived in the house too you can say just grow them like you would any cactus or succulent for the most part they're gonna want a little bit more water than like a desert cactus but not an awful lot general house plant care for everything i've been talking about right don't let them sit in water avoid drafts all that normal house plant care and these are one where if you don't want to lift them maybe you have them in the ground in front of a garden bed then you don't have to lift them you can just go through and cut everything off and just take those little pieces stick them into some soil maybe put a bag over the top if you're worried about humidity you can have all kinds of cuttings and make a whole bunch of them to plant out for next year without much fuss too it's a pretty easy one to prop and keep indoors okay and the next one i don't have any of either which is weird because i almost always plant this annual but i didn't do it this year gartenmeister fuchsias or fuchsia gartenmeister is the proper name for that one it's a beautiful tropical fuchsia they do really well indoors for me i've never had one die on me during the winter time i make sure that they're getting very bright ambient light in the morning they might get some direct sun through the windows but otherwise it's just a nice long day of being in a bright room for the most part and i water them very sparingly so i generally would give them a drink when they're probably about 50 percent on the dry side or just when i start to notice wilt then i water and pay attention to that and that might be something that you have to do when you move your annuals inside is just gauge it on how they're behaving and learn when they want their watering because there's not a one size fits all of the watering pretty sure i've made that point already but it's the same idea as with say like the lantana the pakistakis the crossandra where you have options you can grow them in really bright direct light and if you have a warmer environment you're going to need to be watering them more often and all that stuff but if you don't have a extra warm household like maybe you don't have a sunroom something along those lines then they can just chill and hang out the only issue i ever have them is they get kind of leggy and that's an easy thing to fix you just cut them in half and they fill back out and they look pretty good they don't do a ton of flowering if you're not giving them a lot of light but they carry over to the next year it's one less plant that you have to buy spike plants dracaena australis dracaena indivisa cordolin indivisa cordolin australis a plant of many names the only proper name for the spike plant is cordolin australis chances are if you bought them it's labeled as a cordolin indivisa which is incorrect regardless the spike plant these are great to keep indoors they make an excellent house plant i grow them just like i would a ponytail palm but a ponytail palm that needs just a little bit more water and not quite as much light you don't have to give a ponytail palm a lot of light but they'll grow better the more light that they have with these i just move them in and stick in some place where i would in any other floor plant and water them probably every 10 to 14 days something along those lines and that's about it and the spot in the house where i've kept them is more it's not the north side of the house the house is positioned in awkward way but they get bright ambient morning light and that's about it throughout the rest of the day only issues that i've ever encountered are brown tips but heck i have this outside right now and it's got some brown tips on it and that's with the humidity and everything it just happens and they can be very long lived you can grow these for years on end as a house planter keep them in the house during the winter time move them back out during the summer plant your annuals around them they don't have to be just this little few grassy leaves that you buy for like one to three dollars you throw in the middle of a container every year you can keep these for a really long time i think that's 
one of my favorite as far as investment plants goes when you're thinking of the annuals that you buy for the garden just a few dollars you get a little spike plant in the springtime by the end of the growing season with enough fertilizing and watering all that stuff they should be about three to four feet tall and then you have them for years many 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 years years on end and they're more cold tolerant than pretty much everything else i've talked about so you can move them back outside earlier than everything else they can take some light frost i won't let them take heavy frost but they can take some so for me i can move these back outside usually late march into april as opposed to any of the other annuals i've talked about in this video which won't come out for me until probably may somewhere along those lines whenever i don't have to worry about frost anymore and the daytime temperatures are fairly warm no, not these they're not as fussy they make good house plants it's probably my favorite out of all the ones i've talked about really because it looks like a true house plant and it's not going to be as messy because it's not a flowering plant you don't have to worry about their stems rotting out of too much moisture around them probably the easiest of everything they're fairly versatile plants it's one of the reasons i like them they will do their best with a lot of light so the more light you can give them the better and if you don't have a spot in your home where you get that kind of light then just don't water them as often and move them back outside as soon as you can they'll appreciate that Oh my gosh, everything's so dry. There's no humidity in the air today. I've already watered. I'm going to have to go through and do it again. All right. And last but definitely not least, Shrubolanthes. Shrubolanthes dirianus, the Persian shield. I guess I could say, like with a lot of these other plants, this may not be something that's sold as an annual where you live. Where I live, they're always out with the annuals. You can get them for a few bucks. They turn into really big, bushy, purple, just majestic plants. And these do great indoors you don't have to do much for them bright indirect light the more light you give them probably the better but if you have an arid environment if your home's really dry i wouldn't give them too much sun because you have some issues with crispy leaves on them and i water them when they're probably out 50 percent dry somewhere along those lines and if they get leggy you just cut them back like so it's everything else and you can prop them real easily from the stem so if you have to cut them back then you've got lots of cuttings that you can get going and have a whole bunch more to put out in the garden next year never had issues with spider mites on these definitely haven't had issues with aphids sometimes scale can be an issue particularly soft scale i've noticed seems to enjoy them and sometimes mealybugs but i don't know i have a lot of other plants that mealybugs seem to prefer over the strobilanthes great alternative to coleus i thought about putting coleus on the list but there are just so many different things to talk about with keeping coleus indoors because it can be pretty finicky. Kind of like the impatience. The impatience can be a little finicky too, but not like the coleus. So I think it's a good alternative. These can last a long time. I've had strobilanthes before that I think I've had around for like six, seven years before I ended up swapping out and getting new ones that were looking more fresh. Beautiful plants. They look really good in the house too. When it's time to try and figure out which plants may do well in the house, the thing I think about the most is how versatile is the plant. So a plant that you can grow in the shade or part shade or in the sun, usually a good candidate to have in the house because they're not going to be quite as picky. And plants that can grow in a really dry environment or a very moist environment, usually pretty good to have in the house. And there are other plants that really prefer things more on the warm side, like bananas, colocasias, heliconias. Uh, coconut palms not very good house plants you can do it but there can be a lot of issues that arise while you're trying to keep them happy and that's why i like plants like the spike plant the strobilanthes the carsandra their care is pretty cut and dry i can't believe that i forgot to talk about geraniums geraniums do really well indoors a bright sunny windowsill south facing plenty of sun during the day if things are nice and warm that's even better but if you don't have a warm sunny windowsill for them even part sun and direct light will be okay just don't water them quite as frequently and with all these you want to make sure you're watering deeply i didn't really mention that when i say to water less but that's really just a matter of frequency i would say out of everything i talked about of all 11 plants the chances are the worst one the most difficult one to keep inside during the winter time are going to be the impatience and that's just because they're really only programmed to grow for a year and they don't do much without a lot of warmth so it's more something you move inside and you just you know give it a drink every now and then make sure they're cut back so they don't get leggy it, another reason you want to cut them back is because they're programmed to flower for a certain amount of time and then die so you want to cut them back so you can disrupt that cycle some uh, the sun impatience specifically 
I have a more difficult time with them indoors than I do just your regular landscaping patients because the sun patients really seem to not do much in the house unless it's warm, which is odd because outdoors, the regular impatience, they die back much faster than the sun impatience do. The sun impatience will usually keep flowering for me even through some light frost, whereas the light frost takes those down completely. It's interesting how those things don't always add up. It just takes experience working with them to kind of start to see those eccentricities. All right, that's going to do it. Hope everybody's doing well, having a great day, great life, and everything's going absolutely beautiful for you. I've got some eggs. See the eggs that kind of show on camera? You can kind of see it. See it sticking out there? Comment down below. What are some of the things that you move inside during the winter time? Some of your strategies? Do you have favorite annuals that you treat as houseplants? Or maybe you don't even grow them as annuals. Maybe you buy it as an annual and you're like, I don't know. I'm keeping that indoors. Yeah, let us know. It's always fun seeing what people are doing in their different climates and even just what's available. Because like I said, a lot of what I'm talking about as annuals might not be things that people are growing as annuals or available at your garden centers. Maybe there's some other interesting things. Let us know. All right, as always, and most importantly, everybody, keep on growing. Bye-bye.